Today we celebrate the resurrection. And what a beautiful word, resurrection. It's got so many powerful connotations to it, but it's so much more than just a word. Resurrection is for the church, it's our DNA. You could say our divine nature and authority. We are children of the resurrection. And what I mean by that is that for every believer, the resurrection of Christ is our starting place. It's our beginning. Now you may be watching and you would not call yourself a believer and perhaps wonder, well, what on earth has the resurrection of Jesus to do with my life or the problems that I'm facing right now? Well, because of the power that comes by the hearing of the gospel, I believe that even to speak of the resurrection of Christ can result in that resurrection becoming a new beginning for any person who finds these words bringing peace and light into their lives because the resurrected Christ always announced the arrival of his presence in the same way. Peace be with you. It's because of Christ's resurrection that we who were separated from the life of God, what the Bible calls dead in our sins, are now by the grace of God through the gift of faith, alive to God and alive in God. And that gift of faith comes by hearing God speak to you. And the good news I have for you today is that God does that. God still speaks today and his voice still has the same power today. It has always had the power to raise the dead, the power to bring life even to what is dead, even perhaps to someone listening who has lived as if God is dead to you and you are to him. Now, I shared last week that, in fact, Jesus had an explanation for how this happens. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. In other words, just hearing the truth about who God is and what he has done for you, by those words comes God's spirit, his presence into our lives. Now, that is a work of God's spirit. I can no more explain to you how that happens than I can explain how I fell in love with my wife, but I know that love was real and all that has happened since has confirmed that reality. And so too, I know there has come moments in my life when God spoke to me, where he speaks to me, and I am changed by his words because I find that faith comes. Now, I am so relieved that all the glory for that goes to him, goes to what he has spoken, and that it's not, that it's not down to something that I have to manage to do first before he would speak to me. Despite what religion may have convinced you of for years, God is not in such a bad mood with you that he refuses to speak his words of life to you until you first get yourself cleaned up a bit more. I mean, there are so many problems with that you first idea that I wouldn't know where to begin. In fact, that was my own problem for many years. A message that inferred that God was looking to me first to do something for him before he would do something for me always left me starting in the wrong place. The Christian life does not begin in me, it begins in him. I once heard a story about an American tourist who was traveling around Ireland and he stops his car beside an old Irish farmer sitting on a wall and asks him a question. Excuse me, how do I get to Dublin? And back came a very strange answer. Well, if I was going to Dublin, I wouldn't start from here. To know the life of God, to know peace with God, you cannot start from what you first need to do for him. You must start from what he first did for you. What I want to show you this morning is that the resurrection of Christ is the public announcement of what he has done for you. It is the announcement of what is, not what may be, if you. You see, that's why the resurrection means that our faith can rest, because faith can rest in what is, but it cannot rest in what may be if you first. And that's why religion can give you no rest, for it can never tell you if you've done enough. Have you noticed that? God is not waiting until you first get yourself cleaned up a bit more before he will speak to you his words that bring faith, that bring life, his faith, his life. As we've seen over the last two Sundays, he's not a God who stands back from us, nor withholds from us. 
and indeed our first experience of this is that he speaks to us. Now you may say, well, how do you know he speaks? How do you know God speaks to you? I know because his words change me in a way that no man's words ever have. I find that his words impart to me, they give to me his life. And so because of the things he has spoken to me, I find growing in my life, his life, his faith, his peace, his patience, his gentleness, his love. I know also that God speaks to me because when I want to know what God is like, I only have to look at the Son, at Jesus. I only have to look once again at Jesus spending so much time talking to everyone and anyone. So much time around tables where people like to talk that the religious folk of his day eventually came to a conclusion which is recorded in Luke 7, 34. They said, he's a glutton, he's a drunkard, he is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. What a wonderful name to have, eh? Have you got that picture in your mind, okay, of Jesus hanging out around those tables, talking for hours, and all those religious people not liking it? Talking with all the people that religious folk thought he shouldn't even be speaking to. Now, add to that picture what Jesus said about himself to his disciple Philip. He said, don't you know by now, Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You see, religion today still can't handle the fact that God speaks to people in a way that they think he should only speak to people who first do something for him. And that's because religion, which is self-effort, in all its many guises and disguises, is always a you first message. You first need to love God enough to do something about your life so that God will turn to you and bless you with his presence. In other words, if you, then God. Can you see that a message that says, if you, then God, is a you first message? The gospel is good news precisely because it is not a you first message. It is a he first message. Long before you loved him or give anything to him, he loved you and gave everything to you. The Apostle John said it so beautifully. We love because he first loved us. That's 1 John 4, 19. If you find the love in your heart to turn away from this world and to turn to God, that love is only there because he first loved you. If you love him, it is because he first, not you first. The Christian life does not begin in you, it begins in him. His love always comes first. In fact, this is how he so loves. He loves by giving first. Listen to John again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Notice in God that loving and giving cannot be separated. God's love could not wait until you do something because his love is a love that gives and gives first. God's love is his very nature. The Bible says God is love. That's John again. If God's love always gives first, then can you see that he can't be the God of religion? He can't be the God who says, if you first do something for me, then only then will I do something for you. So he can't be the God who says, if you will do something about the sins in your life, then I will repent of turning away from you and I will turn to you and bless you. Why not? Because that is not how he loves. The love of God is not like the love of man because God's love is not something he does, but rather who he is. And he is who he is, always has been and always will be. He doesn't change because his love doesn't change. You and I and all our prayers and all our good works did not make God love us and do not make God love us. Now you may say, where's your proof of that? Calvary before heaven and earth, before all of creation, so that there would be no mistake, 2,000 years ago on that cross, the lie Adam believed that threw us all down into self-effort was blown out of the water. The lie that God is a God who is withholding his life from us until we first do something. For there on that cross, the love of God was demonstrated 
And in seeing his love, in seeing how he loves, we saw his true nature, that he is a God who cannot separate loving from giving. His love is not a love that can wait until we are less sinful to give to us. And the cross is the demonstration of what that sort of love, the love of God, the nature of God looks like. For God demonstrated his love in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5 verse 8. What a beautiful verse. Read it, read it again, read it and weep. And then let thanksgiving rise up in you that you are so loved. And as you let this love that gives, this truth about God into your life, you will find that this love that gives has already given to you this same love. You will find yourself loving God in a way that you could not before. You will find yourself loving God because he first loved you. Now listen to the words of Jesus again. When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now look at Jesus dying for you on that cross and see the Father dying for you to receive his love, the love that gives, not according to what we deserve, but according to the generosity of the one loving. For as the Apostle Paul declared to the Corinthians, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Listen to the same verse in the New Living Translation. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting men's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. This wonderful message of reconciliation is only wonderful because it is not a message about what you need to do about your sins, but a message about what he has done about our sins. Religion says do, the gospel says done. Here is the wonderful difference between the you first do something about your sins message and the he first did something about your sins message. The you first message leaves your hope on yourself. That's a recipe for a lifetime of condemnation and confusion for always traveling but never arriving. A lifetime of constantly feeling measured and judged. Welcome to the world of religion. You see, the danger with the you first message is that it's so appealing. It really appeals to the flesh. It appeals to the pride of man, whose hope has always been in himself and his ability to do enough to move God. You see, with pride comes blindness. And how many of us have, as religious folk for years have been so blind that we couldn't see that to believe that you can change God, that you can get him to repent of his ways through what you're doing, that isn't humbling yourself. True humility is to put your pride in your back pocket and just take the gift. You don't have to move God. Did you get the memo? He already moved. God moved from heaven to earth. He set aside his glory. He came in flesh. He lived. He died. He rose again. He ascended to heaven. He poured out his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit has been moving through the lives of countless millions ever since. God moved. He moved to you, church. Your move. You see, someone once said, true humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. You know, the best way to do that is to let your life be totally consumed, totally captivated by the grace of God. If you really want to humble yourself, then admit what the gospel says. Admit that when you were in your sins, you could do no more about your sins, about your condition, than a dead person can do about being dead. The law, all those commandments of God that religious folk love to quote and lay in the backs of believers and say, you first need to do this before God will bless you, they were not given so that we could discover in ourselves the power to do something about our sins, never mind the power to make God change his mind about us. The law was given so that every boasting mouth would be shut before God, so that we could try and fail and try and fail enough times in our own strength to finally realize that we don't have the strength, we don't have the power to raise ourselves out of our sins. We need someone to do something about our sins and then show us that something has been done about our sins so that we can enter into a life where our hope is not in ourselves and what we will do, but in God and in what he has done. A life where our faith 
is not in a sinning less life, but in a sinless life. And for this, we have what the Apostle Paul called the gospel of God's grace, the news, the almost too good to be true news, that something has been done about our sins. The resurrection is the demonstration of that. So you see, when this news was first preached in all its fullness, it offended religious people so much that it caused riots throughout the ancient world. Here is news so good that when Paul preached it in a city called Antioch of Pisidia, which is modern day Turkey, the whole city turned out to hear it and half of them were left delirious with joy and the other half were left furious with offense because they all heard clearly what this news was announcing. Paul was announcing nothing less than the abolition of self-effort, the abolition of religion. He was announcing to them what he would later proclaim to the Romans. What the law was powerless to do, Christ did. Let me put it another way. What all your repenting and turning from your wicked way could not do, Christ did. That is why we, the church, are called to be ministers of the new covenant, not the old, because standing between the two is the cross and the resurrection. What God did and the proof of what he did. The gospel is not a you first message but a he first message. No wonder one of the things that Paul first wrote was that before Jesus came, no one had truly seen the Father at any time. Only the Son, he who came from the very bosom of the Father, has revealed him. That's John 1.18. In fact, from the original Greek word there for revealed, we get the word exegesis. It means to bring out the true meaning. Jesus is the only true exegesis of the Father. Whatever scripture you try and interpret, whether it be in the Old Testament or the New, must be seen through the revelation of the Father that Jesus brought. That's why every Bible study should begin with the words of Luke 24, 27, where it is recorded how the resurrected Jesus taught the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It says that he took them to the law and the prophets and showed them that they were all speaking of him, him and what he would do, not them and what they would do. The gospel of Christ and him crucified is not a message of what will be if you first, but a message of what is because he first. You know, that's worth saying again. The gospel, Christ and him crucified, is not a message of what will be if you first. It is the message of what is because he first. It is a Christ-centered message because it leaves your faith on his sinless life, not on your sinning less life. And for this reason, it has always, like Jesus, had a rough reception from the religious. Let me read you the very words that Paul spoke that set off that riot in Antioch. Spreading the news got Paul thrown out of that city and guess who threw him out? According to Acts 13.50, it was the devout people of the city who got rid of him. Listen to his words from Acts 13, 38 and 39. He said, we are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight, something the law of Moses could never do. Here's that wonderful news again. What the law was powerless to do, God did. What you first could not do, he first did. You see, you first is a message of good advice. Here is what you need to do for God before he will. He first is a message of good news. Here is what God has done for you. Oh, wow. And there's so much power in what God has done that even hearing of it causes a change in your life. Now, each time the church mixes a little if you first in with the message of he first, a little power leaves the message. Keep watering the gospel down like that and eventually you're left with a gospel that no longer moves cities or offends the religious, but leaves churches quietly sitting on the high street, blending right in with all the other organizations giving good advice and leaving people's hopes on their own performance. To know the life of God, to know peace with God, you cannot start from you first. 
what you first need to do for him. You must start with what he first did for you. The resurrection of Christ is the public announcement of what he has done for you. It is the announcement of what is, not what may be, if you. That's why the resurrection means that our faith can rest, because faith can rest in what is, but it can never rest in what may be, if you, first. That's why religion will give you no rest, for it can never tell you if you've done enough. We needed someone to do something about our sins and then show us that something has been done about our sins so that we could enter into our life where our hope is not in ourselves and what we will do, but in God and in what he has done. A life where our faith is not in a sinning less life, but in a sinless life. For this, we have the cross and the resurrection. The cross was God doing something about our sins. Only he could. The resurrection was God showing us that something has been done about our sins. You know, Paul once declared to the church in Corinth, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is worthless and we are still in our sins. But even that statement reveals the wonderful truth at the heart of the gospel. Because Christ was raised from the dead, our faith is not worthless and we are not still in our sins. In other words, the gospel directly connects Christ's resurrection to our condition. And that's why the Apostle Paul told the Romans that they were always to present themselves before God as those alive from the dead. Isn't that amazing? That's Romans 6, 13. It is because of his resurrection that we who were dead in our sins, separated from the life of God, are now, by the grace of God, through the gift of faith, alive to God and alive in God. And that gift of faith comes by hearing God speak to you. And the good news I have for you today is that God still speaks today and his voice still has the power to raise the dead, still has the power to bring life even to what is dead, even to you listening this morning who have lived as if God is dead to you and you to him. Let's pray. Oh Father, the life you have always wanted for us is not a life ruled by fear, but a life filled with love. A love that is not self-serving, that is not easily angered, a love that keeps no record of wrongs. Your love. Thank you that we can know such love because you first loved us. Thank you for sending your presence, your Holy Spirit, so that whoever hears this message and desires to know you can right now find faith in their hearts to believe that you are this good, that you are the God who cannot separate loving from giving. And in finding your faith, they will find your peace, which announces your presence. Thank you for your cross, where you first did something about our sins. Thank you for your resurrection, where you first showed us that you had done something about our sins. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, for it is only by the grace of God that we can say such things. We declare all this in Jesus' name. God bless you and have a wonderful Resurrection Sunday. Thank you for listening today and for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, if you felt God speak to you today and you want to get in touch, please feel free to do that. You can do that through the platforms of YouTube and Facebook. Go to River City Church Ireland or email us at info at rivercityapostolic.org. God bless you.